a service of KIBMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old-time radio. the circus. Jerry of the Circus. Well, fine, Jerry. <laughs> yeah, that was all right. Oh, yes, Jerry. Hey, did you see that last jump, Whitey? <laughs> you bet I did, Jerry, and a mighty clean jump it was. Eh, come on now, better put Splendor up. He's had about enough. Okay. Uh, there. Wait, I bet he could go on jumping all day if he had his way about it. Yeah, I suppose so, but you mustn't forget that he hasn't been having so much exercise lately, and too much all at one time isn't the best thing in the world for him. Yeah, I know. You know, you've sort of been neglecting your duties with this little colt. Well, it's been weeks since you've taken him for a ride. Well, Jiminy, I've been so busy with El Mundo and doing my act and everything, I just I know, I know, Jerry. Yeah, you have been busy. Well, come on now. Come on, Splendor. You know, Jerry, I, I can't get over the way you ride. That is, considering that you haven't been at it steady. Don't I ride all right? Well, you just bet you do. Why, if you'd practiced as much with Splendor as you have with El Mundo, well, I'll venture to say you'd be as good a horseman as any of the Russoffs. Oh, any old time. You're just saying that because you don't like Boris. Not on your life, Jerry. No, sir. You're right at home up in the saddle. Oh, sure. I like to ride. And it's easy for me now. Well, maybe someday you'll get tired of doing that act with El Mundo and do a riding act with Splendor. Here. Maybe I can do both. You mean do your act with the elephant and then turn right around to a riding act, too? Why, sure. I'd be a circus all by myself. I'll just bet you'd like to at that. Oh, I'm only kidding, Whitey. <laughs> hey, here's Splendor. Right up here to the line. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, just tie him up there. Yeah, I'll get his saddle off. Oh, you had a nice run for yourself, didn't you, Splendor? Uh, you want to get his bridle off, Jerry? Uh, sure. Easy, Splendor. Oh, still now. Yeah, there we are. Should I uh, put his blanket on? Nope, I don't think you'll need that, Jerry. It's plenty warm under this horse top. He won't be catching cold. I sure hope not. He's had his share of being sick. Uh, more than his share for a little fella. Yeah, we come very close to not having Splendor during that spell of his. Don't I know it. But you sure did your share in helping him get well. Yeah, I'll never forget how you stayed up all night taking care of him. I'd do as much for... Yeah. Well, for, for... For me, huh, Jerry? Oh, well, sure, or anybody. <laughs> that a boy. Hey, Whitey. Uh, hello? Jerry back there with you? Uh, yeah, come on back at the far end. Who is it, Whitey? Uh, I don't know, Jerry. I couldn't get the voice. Oh, I see who it is. Uh, who is it? It's Jack Hastings. Oh. Uh, hiya, Jack. Hello, Jerry. Bob Scott, I find you over here. Hiya, Whitey. Okay, Jack, okay. Uh-oh, you got your camera with you. It couldn't be that you're going to take some publicity pictures in the horse top. No, not this time, Whitey. Well, what have you got the camera for, Jack? Well, that's what I was looking you up for, Jerry. I got a few extra plates, and I thought I'd take some pictures of you and El Mundo. No fooling? That's right. We can get a couple of good ones out of the lot. Mr. Randall said I might use them when I set up the new program. There you are, Jerry. Getting famous already. 
Uh, say, Jack, uh, why don't you take a few pictures of Jerry uh, on one of the horses here? What for? He's not doing a riding act. No, he's not, but that's not saying he couldn't. That's so? You bet. Say, you should have been here a few minutes ago when he was uh, taking splendor over those hurdles out back of the tent. A horseman, too, eh, Jerry? Why, I can ride a little. <laughs> Quite a little, Jerry. Quite a little. Well, how about it? You gonna let me shoot a few pictures of you? Well, uh, I can go, can I, Whitey? Yeah, as far as I'm concerned, nothing more for you to do around here. Okay, then I'll see you after a while. Goodbye, Splendor. All right, Jerry. I hope the pictures turn out good. They will. I got a good subject. Meaning me, of course. No, meaning El Mundo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Say, I better stop by the wagon and put on my uniform, huh? Yeah, that's the ticket. You know, Jerry, if we can get a real good picture of you up on the elephant, Mr. Randall might use it next year on the big outdoor billboard. Hey, that would really be something. And my name on it, too, huh? Certainly. Jerry Dugan, youngest elephant trainer in the world. Say, that sure sounds good. I'll bet I'd stop and look at one of those billboards every time I saw one. Well, you would at first, but like everybody else, you'd soon get used to it. Yeah, I guess that's right. Well, here's my dressing wagon. Uh, I'll hurry. Okay, Jerry. I'll go on over to the menagerie shop and get set up. Jack! Jack Hastings! Oh, there you are. Yeah. Hey, you look pretty swell in that costume, my lad. Thanks. I washed up a little, too. <laughs> yeah? Well, you didn't think about your hair, did you? Oh, gee, no. I've got a comb right here in my pocket. I use it every performance, just before I go on. Ah, yeah, there. Uh, there, that's swell. You look all right now. Hey, there's Olsen standing over there in front of the menagerie top now. Olsen! Uh, who is it? Oh, Jack and Gary. That's a break. Now you can give us a hand with El Mundo. Uh, as though we needed any help. Oh, excuse me. I forgot that you're El Mundo's trainer. Hello, Jack. Hey, Jerry, what's the idea of the costume? Well, you Mind see... if I take a couple of shots at El Mundo Olsen? Shots at El Mundo? What are you talking about? He means he wants to shoot some pictures. Oh, so that's it. Sure. Shooting him with a camera won't hurt him none. Uh, come on in. I thought maybe I could get some good publicity pictures of Jerry and the elephant. <laughs> Uh, want me to get El Mundo out back in the sunlight? No, that won't be necessary, Olsen. I've got some flash bulbs here in my case. I can get some good pictures right here under the menagerie oh, top. Right. Besides, I'd like to get a whole line of bulls in the background. Uh, uh, did you say flash bulb? Yeah. Why? Well, now, wait a minute. I I'll have to move those zebras then. Why, Olsen? Oh, because those little critters just won't stand for flash bulbs going off. They'll start stampeding and cutting up something awful. I don't want to put you in any trouble. Oh, it's no trouble, Jack. Hey, you fellas, come over here and take these zebras out back while we uh, take some pictures. Okay, boss. Uh, right away, boss. Well, they'll have them out of there in a minute. Okay, thanks, old. Yeah. Hey, is that a new camera, Jack? Nope. It sure looks new. I keep it that way, Jerry. That's all he's got to do, Jerry, just take a few pictures once in a while and keep his camera shined up. Oh, sure, that's all. Just that and a couple of hundred other things. <laughs> well, well, the zebras are gone now. You can start your picture making any time. Okay. Now, Jerry, get up on El Mundo's head. I want to see how this is going to line up in the camera. Okay. El Mundo. Descanso. Descanso, El Mundo. <laughs> That's the boy. He doesn't know what to make of it doing a show this time of day. <laughs> That's good right there, Jerry. Hold it. Still now. Oh, that looks like a good pose. That was all right. Now, now sit down on his head, Jerry. That's right. That's right. Now, now, now put your right hand up in the air. Like this? No, straight over your right head. Over your head, Gary. Lean forward a little. That's right. Now, hold still. Say, that was a peach. Yeah, nice shot. Now what? You can get down now, Jerry. We'll take a couple with you in front of El Mundo. Okay. Here I come. Watch me. <laughs> See you slide down that trunk. <laughs> That's pretty clever, all right. <laughs> hey, can I use your crop, Olson? Uh, oh, sure, Gary. Here you are. Thanks. Uh, now, you want me to make him sit up? Yeah, that's the idea. We'll take one with you right under him. Okay. El Mundo, say on to see. Say on to see, El Mundo. Hey, how's that? Good. Good, Jerry. Hold it. Oh, that was that dandy picture. Okay. El Mundo, Descanso, Chrono. Hello. What's going on in here? It's fine. You're making fire. Oh, oh hello, Fancy <laughs> boys. How are you? Hello, Wilson. And Jack Hastings. Well, that explains the flashes of light. Just taking a few pictures of Jerry and El Mundo. Uh -huh. We saw the light flashes and came to find out what it was. Well, that's it, Jerry. Oh, is that all you're going to take now? That's all the plates I have, boy. We'll take some more some other time. Okay. Oh, hello, Patsy. Hi, Jerry. Hello, boy. Say. Oh, what's the matter? 
Gee, Boris, where did you get that black eye? What? Well, I uh, mean, <laughs> look at that. Well, you see, I... Uh, well, oh, 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 Boris was going into his uh, wagon after the performance uh, last uh, night, and, oh, and it was dark, and he uh, ran into the door. Oh, oh, uh, yeah. Isn't that what you told me, Boris? Uh, yes, uh, yes, that is exactly what happened. Uh-huh. Uh, for the performances, I put a little makeup on it, and it does not show. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yes. See. Uh, generates a bedpost, ain't it, Boris? <laughs> Come on, <laughs> now, well, now that's not fair. <laughs> well, Jerry, what now? Uh, where are you going? Well, uh, I better get back to the wagon. Well, come on, then. I'll walk over with you. Uh, you coming, Boris? No, yes. Yes, of course. Goodbye, Jack, and thanks a lot for taking the pictures. Okay, Jerry. I'll show them to you as soon as we get them ready. Uh, don't forget. Uh, goodbye, Olsen. So long, Jerry. Well, you're sure, surely getting to be the star act, Jerry. Having your picture taken all hours of the day. Come on, let's go through the side entrance here. It takes us closer to the wagon. All right. Hey, uh, have you seen Boss? Yes, a little while ago. He and Slash are doing their weekly washing. I guess I really ought to give Rags a bath, too. It's nice weather for it. Now, here we are. Oh, thank you, Boris. Not at all, my little lady. <laughs> Say, it is quicker to come out this way, isn't it? Sure it is. I know the shortcuts. I guess you do, Boris. Hey, there's your sister, Boris. They're on your wagon stand. Oh, yes, and I must see her. Uh, Olga, wait, I want to see you. Uh, excuse me, please, Patsy. Surely, Boris, go right ahead. Uh, Jerry can escort me now. All right, goodbye. Uh, goodbye, Jerry. See you later, Boris. So long. What is it, buddy? Wait. What do you mean, wait? Go into the wagon. I do not want to talk here. Now close the door. Close the door. All right, all right. I was just walking around the lot with Patsy. I noticed that. Patsy tells me that she's going to buy an annuity with the money she received. An annuity? Yes, it's a it's a form of insurance. And once she puts the money there... You will not be able to get it from yes, her. Yes, that's exactly it. No matter what she does with it, I do not think you are clever enough to get it from her anyway. Olga, I do not like remarks like that. It is true. You have failed, not only once, but twice. First, you try to take her into the family to get her money, but she turns you down. It is not so. It is so. And the truth hurts your ears. Olga? Wait. You listen to me now. You've tried by yourself long enough. I know women. I know how to appeal to her. Oh, you must listen to me, Boris. We must work together. Ah. You make a fool of yourself, letting that roustabout give you that black eye. You have nothing more to try. No more schemes. And you have one? Yes. And I think a good one. What is it? Oh, you are willing to listen to me now. Oh, what is the plan? A woman likes to think herself smart. She likes to believe she's as good with business matters as a man. Yes, yes, all right, that is true, so? Why not appeal to her business judgment? Make her a proposition to invest her money for great return. What would that be? What is it you want most? A circus of your own, yes? Certainly. Well, then tell her to invest her money in your new circus. Tell her you are going to start your own circus in Europe or somewhere. She knows there is a lot of money to be made with a good show. Mm-hmm. And the plan sounds very reasonable. Uh-huh. I, I have it. I will tell her we're going to take a circus to South America. And for her $20,000, I will make her a partner. I'll get that money from her yet. <laughs>
the psalmist said, When I awake, I am still with thee. For the child of God, seeking the presence of the Lord is essential as each day begins. To help you in starting this day with God, we offer a brief devotional meditation from morning and evening, a collection from the pen of one of the greatest preachers of all time, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. This morning's text is found in Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 25. He that watereth shall be watered also himself. We are here taught the great lesson that to get we must give, that to accumulate we must scatter, that to make ourselves happy we must make others happy, and that in order to become spiritually vigorous we must seek the spiritual good of others. In watering others, we are ourselves watered. How? Our efforts to be useful bring out our powers for usefulness. We have latent talents and dormant faculties, which are brought to light by exercise. Our strength for labor is hidden even from ourselves, until we venture forth to fight the Lord's battles or to climb the mountains of difficulty. We do not know what tender sympathies we possess until we try to dry the widow's tears and soothe the orphan's grief. We often find in attempting to teach others that we gain instruction for ourselves. Oh, what gracious lessons some of us have learned at sick beds! We went to teach the Scriptures. We came away blushing that we knew so little of them. In our converse with poor saints, we are taught the way of God more perfectly for ourselves and get a deeper insight into divine truth. So that watering others makes us humble. We discover how much grace there is where we have not looked for it, and how much the poor saint may outstrip us in knowledge. Our own comfort is also increased by our working for others. We endeavor to cheer them, and the consolation gladdens our own heart. Like the two men in the snow, one chafed the other's limbs to keep him from dying, and in so doing kept his own blood in circulation and saved his own life. The poor widow of Zarepta gave from her scanty store a supply for the prophet's wants, and from that day she never again knew what want was. Give them, and it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down and running over. This meditation was taken from Morning and Evening by C. H. Spurgeon. Please listen each morning at this same time for Morning and Evening. story ever told. Presented by the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. Today we present The Fool and the Fish, a drama based upon a teaching that forth in the sixth chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke, a teaching from the greatest love ever lived. The city of Jerusalem and the faint pink light of early morning bathed the walls of the city in a soft glow. Now the light slants across the golden roof of the temple, giving added color to its own ornateness. The great city begins to stir and wait from the quiet of night. But there are a few men who have long been awake and have already considered serious business. Now, for example, a captain of the temple guard faces his superior officer if he asks, Oh, you have sat for a long time. It is one thing that would suit me. You have a tongue? Ask. Yes, sir. Thank you for me regarding the uh, prophet Jesus in Galilee. 
surely you tell me that's a special picture. Have you ever known me to talk in vain? That's why I asked. What am I to do about it? You are to go to Ganymede to observe this man, to ask about him, to gather as much information as you can, and then report back here to me. But well, I'm an officer of the Temple Guard. I have no power in Galilee. Galilee is hired, Scott. I have not asked you to see the prophet, only to observe him. So I do not see what right I have in Galilee. They say you should obey without questioning. It will disturb you not to know, brother. In Galilee, I am without authority. If this should be trouble, I must know how to explain my presence. There is something in what you say. It's a great deal. But something. A man, A very clever man, O sir. Vigilant and suspicious to carry out of your duties. And wily enough to learn more than anyone ever intended that you know. Surely, sir, if an officer of the temple guard is not alert and vigilant, he cannot carry out his duties. And if he is alert and vigilant, he can gather enough information to assure himself for promotion. Is that it? So you know that I serve to the best of my ability? Oh, of course, O sir. Well, I will promise you this. Bring us back what we want to know, and you will have your permission. Hi. You and Caiaphas? You, you have his word, too. So the high priest wishes to know about this Jesus of Nazareth. And if he does, and he surely wants to know nothing good, if he's evidence to use against the man, he can put it in danger. Don't worry. With the promotion in the offering, I should be sure to find what you want. You can depend on me. I have always known that, A.C. When did he leave? He was my servant and caught our things for the journey. A good idea of taking someone with you. A witness in the event your word is disputed by the others, here. Of course. Well, A.C., good luck, Convention. Yes. The luck is in being chosen. From now on, I'll make my own luck. Good morning, sir. Sir, <laughs> so, so I cannot tell you how this music started me. To be able to make a journey to Galilee, I have a part of my service to you. It will not be a vacation, David. Remember that. Uh, I know that, sir. Still, I have family in Galilee, and I have not seen him in some years now. My cousin Zara, for instance. Where's my sister? I'm not a cousin. They are honest and they're not allowed for social activity. In fact, it was secret. That's why I had you pack for me clothes other than my uniform. You go as far. You might as well use the word. In Galilee, I must secure evidence of the man and then return as quickly as possible. The man? Which man? A fool. A prophet. But evidently a successful one. He's given the high priest cause of worry. Well, one man's trouble is another fortune. I shall secure promotion out of this. You, David, will have a little extra money to spend from now on. You seem very sure this time, sir. I am. If you find out what the high priest wishes to know, and then this master would better be careful. Sir, did you say the master? Yes, what are you? Why do you look so distressed? Surely he is not going to get a story. Who sure he is? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What's the matter, you David? Your face is going white. Somebody say, I need to fall off your donkey. What is it? It's said, please, before going to the next one. You've got to be a fool. We can turn you on. I'm not stopped here to talk over such matters with you. This is an important journey to me. The quicker it's over, the better. Then we'll reach the city gate. Can you stand there for just a few minutes? All right, then we'll reach the gate. <laughs> Smart here, David. Yes, sir. One stop. I'll be smart first and help you. Yes, sir. No, 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 sir. Now, David, what's the meaning of this? Why does it need such a meeting to interrupt my journey to argue such a matter with me? Then what's this telling me? What was happening in preparation for the journey? It didn't know. Didn't know what? But all this had to do with the master. What difference can it make now that you do know? Sir, you do not understand. My cousin's girl, the one I mentioned to you, you remember? Yes, I remember, David, but come to the point of no time. My cousin's girl, she has a daughter. And she was dead. Yes, dead. And so she would have remained. 
If the master had not loathed her, it's true. You don't believe that, do you? But it, it happened. It did happen. I know it to be true. That's the girl. The girl was not dead. She was a fake, perhaps. The mourners were already in the house. She was dead. I don't believe it. So I give you my word that it happened. So perhaps it would be bad for the master to go to Galilee. Surely you would not want to be harmed to a good man, an innocent man. A good man. If the high priest has something against him, he cannot be such a good man. I've been told to observe the man who will be teachers and see the effects of it upon the people. They say he's dangerous, evil, that he keeps power for himself. And do you believe it? I intend to find out. In the process, I get myself a promotion. Okay. Get back from your donkey, David. We'll continue with our journey. And I warn you now, if you reveal the purpose of my mission to anyone, you'll suffer for it. Yes, sir. We must make up the first time. When we arrive in Galilee, we will go about as private citizens, making plays. Sir, so, I have heard that you know the master. But then you've seen him, been close to him. But you know him better than anyone else here in the Mayus. Is that true? Oh, yes, indeed. Huh? And tell me, woman, what kind of things did he teach you? I had heard of him many times during my long run. And though no one else could hear me, I felt sure that he could. Somehow I knew. Uh, what did he teach, woman? I was trying to tell you how it happened. Then get on with it. There was nothing anyone could do for me. I had tried every possibility I'd heard of, but no one could help me. I said to myself, he will help me. I know it. And so, weak as I was, I left my bed in my house at the year that he had come here to a nurse. And then I went out and over to There was a great crowd gathered about me. And I made my way to it. And believe me, sir, if I had not had faith that he could hear me, I would not have had the strength to insist on it. And then you did, what did you hear in peace? Nothing, sir. Nothing? And why do you tell me all this? David, this woman can be of no help to me. Why did you bring her here? Sir, you have not heard me say. Then get on with it, woman, but quickly, do you hear? Sir, I, I am doing the best I can. <laughs> Please, woman, please do not help. Now tell me. I am sorry, sir. Yet, as I drew close to him and looked upon his face for the first time, I realized suddenly that he was thanked by God. There was no doubt of it. Thanked by God, hmm? Yes, sir. And I asked myself, who am I that I dare ask him to hear me? I am nothing. I am unworthy, I said to myself. So I did not ask him. Instead, I pressed close to him and reached out to touch the hand of his hand. Indeed. Yes, sir. And at once he asked, who touched my toe? Now, this was strange that there was a great crowd pressing about him. Who should not have felt my touch? And what he did, he did. Do not make it sound so important, woman. But it was. And that is what I felt in the news before him and confessed it with me. And then? He reached out to me. Sir, he reached out to touch me and raised me up from the ground. And he said, I oh, have made my soul. He said that, no? Hmm? Yes. And so it was. From that moment on, I have been healed. He cannot know what to do. He cannot. Unless you have been ill as long as I was. Of course, woman. But tell me, what did you hear him teach? Many things. Many, many things. But the one which I love best is this. I really would that men should be to you. Do you even say it to them? Since that day, I have lost all this teaching. I see. Um, thank you, woman, for coming here with my servant to see me. Of course, the merely to hear someone tell you what he has said and done is not enough. You should go to Rome yourself. Oh, I am. There's no doubt of it. David, say the woman out. Yes, sir. This way, woman. When you have seen him, when you have stood in his holy presence, then you will know all there is to know about him. Oh. 
that she never stopped talking. So, Goldie, you have come by our first piece of evidence. I knew that it would impress you. And the woman's face, did you see her eyes? The way they came, the way her tears glistened in them. She did say something that was very interesting. She is sent by God. Oh. Miss David, I must have noticed that in my soul. You mean, no, not so sent by God. Yes. But would it not also be fair to make that he feels the same? He cannot know how sick she was. Women with such an active imagination might only have thought that she was dead. Yet after she found she was better, serious, she'd been nosy and nearly killed. Yes, sir. You seem to forget that I was the one who was sent to report. You will keep your observations to yourself. Now, I've heard enough here in the mayor. Tomorrow at dawn, we will stop for the next time. We will find more people who know him and heard him speak. You will find them for me. As you say, sir. There's no need to stop, David. You're a servant. You do as you're commanded to do. Sir, I... I would like to say this. What? While we have been here in America, I have seen him talk to my cousin Jerry. So it is true, his daughter was dead, and she was then. I do not accept that as evidence of any kind. It's a story that feels like you to believe. So the master does only good this poor woman you just saw. He healed her after a lifetime of sickness. Is that not a blessed thing? Mm-hmm. The church of some kind. What he teaches is what makes him dangerous to piety. That is what I must find out. So tomorrow we go on to the next time. Sir, no questions, nothing. Only orders that you will obey. Is that understood? Yes, sir. It is understood. I do not think that it was necessary for me to go to find the man. You could have brought him to me. So he was suspicious. He told me. We can talk to him here in the marketplace. He's a mixed of... Let's see. What is his place? Uh, that one there. Good. I will find out what I wish to know. Come along. Martin. Good day. Good day, sir. Can you think, sir? I have some time I think to you from the office of the family function. They say these are the best. Yes, an apple. The season is a delicious thing. They are uh, plumping and ripe. I'll have it. Good time. Thank you. Tommy Merchant, I hear that you're a distinguished man here in our belly. I distinguished. Oh, no, sir. I've heard about you. You may have heard about me, sir, but I, I am not distinguished. I am fortunate. Very fortunate to have been chosen by God as an instrument to what you say Congress will have met. God uh, chose you, didn't he? No, 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 no. Yes, and the day I die, I shall use the voice he gave me to pray to. The voice he gave me? Yes. So you would not know what to look at me now, but many weeks ago, this prayer man was useless. He's ill, but he was nothing. And now you will tell me it was the master who uh, healed you. No, no, no. Is it not a wondrous thing? A miracle at the hands of God himself? A wondrous thing, a miracle. I'm very tired of hearing these things. Magic, witchcraft, perhaps. Yes. Yeah. Only just speak of the master, I think. It wasn't one. Tell me this. What does he teach you? I'd like to know that. I remember a very, very young thing he taught. I said, yes, the Lord, thy God, with all thy heart, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength, and thy neighbor as thyself. This is what me, and thy words, very kindly. Words, empty words. Not if men put them to you, sir. He spells about him, goes stranger and stranger. I think the man's a solid, and he says it's all of you. Now, you, you better listen to me. <laughs> yes, sir. It seems be dangerous for people like you to make such claims on his account. Now, be truthful with me. What did he really do to you? I only knew this thing. Once I was deaf and dumb, now I can hear him speak. He wasn't said to me. Come, David, let's get away from here. I can't understand it. Each one of them with another impossible story. It hasn't been said that no good can come out of Galilee. 
You speak with such fools that you see die. Sir, so I know you are angry. But did you see the man's face when he spoke? Sure, he was not mad. Oh, he believed what he said. That's why I should add another note to my report. The master has bewitched these people. Yes, yeah, Carter should make good use of that. Bewitched them? The same kindness he's lost. I would see for myself what a strange spell this man cast. Yes. Next thing for you to do is to find out where he is. You would go to him? You would question him? I wish to see him for myself first, when I may question him. He will not make a fool of me. None of his tricks will affect me. Yes, we must find out where he is. <laughs> So, Dagger, you have seen this man, this master. You heard him speak. Oh, yes, sir. I have. Only this morning he was here at the town gate of Magdala. You come closer to him, David? Yes, sir. I told you you would find him soon. Now, Dagger, tell me, what did he do here? He talked and we listened. He did no miracles here? Miracles? Yes. No. He did miracles. Describe them to me. So there is a man of this town, Eliza is his name, and he was a hard man. He trusted in his own selfishness. He has been a friend to no one, and no one has been a friend to him. In fact, he and Magdala, when one wishes to indicate how impossible a thing is, we say, as difficult as extracting the kindness from Eliza. This will give you an idea. Uh, please, and we have no time to come to the point. Well, this morning, I myself saw Eliza give away money to the poor. I had in my possession a coin which he gave me. Sir, I was sure to you. See? Yes, yes, of course. Miracle. This is the name. What? The master's word changed Eliza from a psychic man to one of kindness and understanding. There were no cripples made whole, no dead raised again to living, no deaf man made suddenly to hear. To us, it was a greater miracle than all of those to change Eliza to a good man. Oh, yes. The master's word, the strength, the strength in his eyes. I see. Then, Dagger, where did he go? He had finished his teaching, but they would not let him go. They followed him out into the desert. And since they had not returned, although I think he must still be teaching them there. Then, surely, this time he's not going to go. He said, I was one. Come, David. Here, Dagger, a coin to your trouble. There is no need for you to give me a coin, sir. It is no trouble. Talk of him. In fact, it has given a purpose to my living. So, uh, come along, David. They need not depart. 
give me them to eat. Yes, them to eat? Yes, sir. There's not even enough food here for half a dozen men. How shall we give all of them something to eat? We have only five small barley loaves and two fish. Bring them hither to me. Yes, master, at once. Here they The five loaves, the fishes, bring them here, please. Good. Lord, Master. Lord, Master. What is it? What's the deal with all of this? I do not know, sir. Except that now he looks up to the heaven of the sea. He saw a blessing over the sea. He saw a blessing over the sea. But what is the whole thing with it? Having so little of it. He thinks that he's only the sea. He was handing the food to one of his disciples. Oh, the blood of God. Yes. I said, the Father has given all the food to one disciple, and yet now he gives as much to a second. But now to a third, it will be more. Yes, Master. 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 Yes, it is impossible it's not food. So we will ask you to use it. Well, sir, we have talked to the sister of the king's below. Yes, no, I see you think. I can only say that he has bewitched me as he has all the others. I think we are even closer to him. I must study him. The pastor will wish to know all about him. He's going to check him. The power he has, the very thing you've seen him do. Surely this makes him more dangerous than I suspected before. We will draw closer to him. Yes, Well, David. David, he is looking at us. It is a perfect No, someone must have told him. How could they know him? But he's looking straight at me. He's going to speak to me. A good food bringeth not forth corrupt food. Neither doth a corrupt food bring forth good food. For every food is known by his own food. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. His words were meant to you. Yes. Yes, I know. And are they not true? How are we to judge him or anyone except by what he does and what he says? But I've been sent to find fault with him, to find evidence against him. Should you not judge by what you've seen and heard? There was hardly seen in those days. And the mother, who healed a woman six many years, and taught her to do unto others as she would have been do unto her. When our Bella has restored healing and speech, to one who was deaf and mute and deaf, and taught him to love his neighbor, as he said. The Magdala, who changed the man from one who was miserly and hateful, to one who was charitable and loving. And here we have seen him see the one in there. You're right, David. I can find no faith in him. His words are good. His deeds are good. Now what's the good judgment? And when you return to Caracas, sir? I shall not return to him, Dave. Mm-hmm. I shall remain here and learn the master's way. There's not so much the power of those miracles which has impressed me as the purpose doctrine. This is truly a way of love and kindness.
program was brought to you by the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. Next week on the same network at this time, we will present The Pure in Heart, a drama inspired by the fifth chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Another episode in the greatest story ever told from the greatest life ever lived. only 300 years ago in this day of Constantine, Emperor of Britain, Spain, Gaul, and all the lands around the Black Sea, and now Emperor of Rome. But when I think of him, I see the woman who was his mother, and I think of all she did, because Helen, Empress of the Empire, was greater than her son. My name is Macarius Titius, bishop to the empress. I am neither Greek nor Roman, nor am I Serbian. I was born a Muslim in the lands that neighbor Jerusalem. I was twelve when I was baptized into the Christian faith, and have since devoted my life to the service of God. Let me first tell you about Helena. She was beautiful but with a beauty that went deeper than the flaxen hair, the blue eyes, the perfect features. At fifty, she could have passed for less than forty, but she had a thirty-four-year-old son, as pagan as his father had been. Still he adored his mother and always wanted her near him, even though he often teased her and called her his foreign mother, for Helena had come from Britain. But why, Mother? Why? Yes, why did you marry my father? <laughs> A barbarian like me. Oh, so you admit you're one. <laughs> I loved your father. He was the finest man I ever knew. You must have loved him to believe that. He was a very good man. Yes, in your beautiful eyes. And not in yours. Well, he never did for you what I'll do for you. Oh. I swear that, Mother. Well, he never became a Christian for me. Will you? <laughs> no. But I'll make you Empress of Rome. So that I can walk where St. Peter walked? Oh, no. No, where Caesar walked. Was it I that taught you ambition, my son? No. If you'd had your way with me, I'd have become a charity worker. Mother, don't you ever get sick of working among the poor? Of course not. Well, they they depress me. Christ was never depressed by them. He loved them. Christ. Don't, son. You believe he's the God, eh? Yes. An ordinary man who lived 300 years ago. No, no, not an ordinary man. No, he was greater than our gods, I suppose, eh? Yes, greater than your gods, darling. Well, no, I, I won't argue. But I'll still make you Empress of Rome. By making war. How else? What if I have no wish? It's my wish, most adored mother. And men must die. Soldiers get paid to die. Do you believe you can take Rome? If I defeat Maxentius... And defeat him I will. But his armies are greater than yours. The Romans have forgotten how to fight, Mother. Besides, I believe in omens. Oh, you do? Yes. And have you had one? Mother, 
What is the language of Rome? Latin. And the language we speak? Greek. And the fact is, the language of Rome is dying. It's scarcely understood even in Italy. And in Spain and Gaul, they're inventing regional dialects instead of using Latin. It's a symbol, Mother. As the Roman language dies, so does Rome. Meantime, our language grows stronger. Why, someday Greek will be the only language in the world. But Latin is the language of the church, my son. And the church won't die. The church. A belief only 300 years old. And the temples of our gods have stood a thousand years or more. But will they stand a thousand years from now? Of course they will. To the memory of the Emperor Constantine and his beautiful mother, Helena. There. What do you think of that? Does it make you happy? Hmm. I think I will never be happy until the day you turn to Christ. <laughs> mother? Yes? What did I just say? Our Greek temples will stand in my memory? Of course I said to yours, too. But didn't I put myself above the gods? You can put yourself above the Greek gods and the Roman gods, too. So I wouldn't worry too much about offending them. Well, I shouldn't joke about them anyway. One can't be too careful. I can't afford to have the gods abandon me. You know, I think I'd better go and make my peace with them. There came a day when I spoke to the Empress on a matter that had long been with me. I was careful not to speak of it while her son was near, and having approached the matter, I was delighted by her frank eagerness. The cross? The very cross on which he died? Buried somewhere on Calvary. How can you be sure? Of that we are certain. And it's never been found? Never. Has anyone ever searched for it? Probably. And and still they didn't find it? No, but it's there. If one found the place. Bishop, come. What have you in mind? An expedition. Would you go? Yes, with your permission. It sounds exciting. And it's expensive. Oh, I think the money can be found. I was sure of that. But I will need a ship. Money I can give you, but a ship? Perhaps the emperor, if you were to ask him. He does have a good heart. And he adores you. Yes, he might, if you were to ask him. A ship to help propagate the Christian faith. Why, you must be mad, Bishop. Are you? I hope not, sire. Uh, One small ship, my son. But I need every ship I have, Mother, for the transportation of troops to Italy. But, but just one small ship. I... Oh, why do I waste time? Eventually, I'll give in to you. All right, Bishop, you can have one ship. And sailors. God bless you. Oh? Which God? If I answer you, I'll anger you. And you may change your mind. Bishop, one more suggestion that I could break my word to my mother. And I'll feed you to the lions. Sire, forgive me. Get out of my sight. But with gratitude, sire. And by your leave, my queen. We'll talk again, Bishop. Son, would you throw him to the lion? With pleasure. A thousand Christians are alive in this city, and I permit them to live only because they share your faith and because it would hurt you if I harmed them. But they're a nuisance to me. At least if I give your bishop a ship, it'll be one way of ridding this palace of him. My expedition sailed in its quest for the Holy Cross. 
During that time, the emperor prepared for his conquest of Italy and his ultimate assault on Rome. A day came when he came to say goodbye to his mother. I believe they stood on the marble terrace facing towards Constantinople. You look worried, Mother, are you? A little. Well, I won't be away long. Only God knows that. Oh, I've been in battles before. There's always the last battle. Believe me, Mother, I'll enter Rome and alive. I pray you will, my son. Be sure of it. Darling, there's something I would like to say. Say anything. I was very young, only 16, when I married your father. I was deeply in love with him. But I know this. We were married according to his belief. And to some extent, according to those I had at the time. I know. Later on, I became a Christian... And it amused him, as it seemed to amuse you. We never interfered with you, Mother. No, no, neither of you did. Still, you were amused. It made no difference to you. No. I'm very proud of my faith. I'm not ashamed to let people know I turned to Christ. A few times I begged your father to become a Christian, but he refused. It was the only thing he ever refused you. And the only thing you refused me. Grant me the same freedom I give you, Mother. But you wouldn't grant it to me if I were not your mother. But you are my mother. Constantine. Hmm? Tell me where I failed you. You haven't. I taught you all about Christ. I taught you the lessons of his life. And still I fail to make you understand. Why? Why? <laughs> Look, your Christ is a man of peace. I am a soldier, the son of a soldier. He and I have nothing in common. Now come, Mother. Embrace me and wish me luck. And before you know it, you'll be the Empress of Rome. Long months after the Emperor sailed with his armies for Italy, I came home from my expedition to the Holy Land. I presented myself to the Empress. You failed. My Queen, it gave me very small consolation to learn that many others have failed too. It seems several persons have searched for the Holy Cross. None found it. And still you think it's there? I am not even sure of that now. We excavate it in every likely place, and to no purpose. I've squandered the money you provided. I have nothing to show for it. The cross must be there if it's never been found. I tell myself that... We can't give up. We can't. My queen, tell me, tell me about your son. Have you had news? He writes often and sends relays of messengers back to me so that I always know within a month of the last things that have happened. He sends letters. Here, read this part of the one I had yesterday. From here. And so, my adored mother, I find myself surprisingly hard-pressed by the Romans. I led my armies across the mountains, meeting with little or no opposition, and finally have camped within sight of Rome. But now I find myself all but surrounded by the armies of Accentius and far outnumbered. In a skirmish this morning, I suffered an outrageous defeat. And now I hear that my second army, which was to join me here, has been intercepted and cut off from me. Be sure, however, that I smile as I suggest I must have offended the gods grievously, since they appear to have deserted me in my hour of gravest need. And still, I am comforted by the thought of your love for me, and know you will pray, even to your own God.
The Empress did pray. We went to the little chapel she had built in the palace, and she prayed. O oh Lord, I know that in thy love I have no need to dread the unknown, that in the strangeness of foreign lands, Thy presence is always there with those we love. O oh Lord, let thy love for my son shine forth now with a radiance so bright he will at last know thee and turn to thee. In the hour of her son's greatest peril, Helen did not pray for his life. She prayed that he might turn to Christ before it was too late. At Saxa Rubra, near Rome, the forces of Maxentius had lain siege to the Emperor Constantine for a full month without launching a full-scale attack. The Romans waited for still more reinforcements to make victory absolutely certain. And in that time... Semi-starvation and considerable sickness plagued the armies of Constantine. And the Emperor stared into the certainty of defeat and death. And so, my adored mother, I fear these words may be the last that I shall send to you. They may not even reach you, for the messenger may not evade the enemy. Within a matter of hours... The Romans will attack me, their numbers perhaps ten times my own, and Rome will be lost to us, and I will be no more. But I cannot say death frightens me. The agony I feel is in the knowledge I will never see you again, and that I have not brought you the one great happiness you have so long prayed for. But if this letter reaches you, you will now be assured that in my last hours, having seen myself deserted by my own gods, I have turned to your Christ. And even though I have no means of being baptized, I feel within myself the things you wanted of me. And as I sat in the opening of my tent, thinking of you and wondering if your God knew what is in my heart, the sky seemed very strange as I looked at them. At one point there seemed to be a cross of fire burning. It was a cross of fire. It was a cross of fire. A sign from the Christian God. A sign. A sign from heaven. There was writing beneath the cross. And it said, Through this sign, thou shalt conquer. And then, Mother, I ordered a cross made and used it as my standard as we gathered ourselves and went forth against the superior enemy. We gained a big victory, beloved mother, and drove Maxentius to his death. And soon afterwards entered Rome, where I have now set myself up as emperor, dedicated to the Christian faith. And I swear to you, mother, that under my rule, Christianity shall become legal. So, my queen, our prayers were answered. And Rome is restored to the Christian world. With a Christian emperor for the first time in history. God be praised. Praised for his miracle. And perhaps that is a sign for us, too. Bishop? The Holy Cross, you it mean? It must be found. But I must go to Rome first while you prepare another expedition. And I'll join you and go with you.
Helena, Empress of Britain, Gaul, Spain, and now Rome. Are you proud, Mother? Proud that the church bells ring because of you. And now, now you want to take off to the Holy Land and I shall of... come back to Rome. Yes, I... I know that, Mother. So God go with you. By sea and by land, we journeyed to the Holy Land, to the very spot on Mount Calvary where our Lord had been crucified but 300 years before. Once again, in company with hired workers, I began further excavations, first in one place, then in another. Until one day, Helena suddenly came to me and pointed to a place beneath a boulder of rock. Look up there. Try that place. The crosses. We found them. Three crosses. There were three. The nails are still in them. But which one is our Lord's? Which one? One of them is holy. There is one way we might find out. Through the woman you spoke to yesterday... The leper. She's dying. She knows that. Tell someone to bring her here. The sick woman was carried to where we stood on the slopes of Calvary. And while the multitude which had gathered watched, the dying woman was touched by each of the three crosses. When the third one touched her, the woman uttered a cry. She stood up, cleansed and completely cured. And even as we stared, she kissed the holy cross and then knelt down to silently pray, as indeed we all did. And now, without waste of time, call the best architects. And we'll build a temple on Calvary to receive the Holy Cross. A temple, yes. A beautiful one. And we must send portions of the cross to Rome and Constantinople to be adored by Christians who cannot come here. We found it. It, it, it seems unreal. You found it. No. No, our Lord found it for us. I'm sure it was he who told me where to look for it. How else would I have known? So you have found the cross, and you built a temple, and now you have come back to Rome. I'm happy now, my darling. I'm happy in Christ because you are. The Lord must love you very dearly, Mother. He loves all of us. He wants only that we love him. National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the National Council of Catholic Men, presents the Catholic Hour. Today's program will consist of music by a unit of the Paulus Choristers and an address by Monsignor Fulton J. Sheen. A group of Paulus choristers open the Catholic Hour with a motet from the Holy Week music. 
We hear the Jerusalem Surge by C. Jaspers. Monsignor Fulton J. Sheen of the Catholic University of America will now deliver the 14th in a series of addresses on the crisis in Christendom. His discourse today is entitled, Freedom in Danger. I present Monsignor Sheen. Friends, today we shall speak about a grave danger facing the world. Not America alone. That danger can be expressed in a word which is on the tongue of everyone, namely, freedom. A proof that we are in danger of losing it is because everyone is talking about it. If you suddenly came into a country where everyone was talking about the health of lungs, you would immediately conclude that a disastrous microbe was rampant. In the last World War, everyone spoke about making the world safe for democracy. And yet the world became so unsafe for democracy that within 21 years, democracy had to stumble into another war in order to preserve itself. Now we ought to be worried about freedom simply because everyone is talking about it. Slaves talk most about freedom. The oppressed talk about justice and the hungry most about food. We are all agreed that the external threat to our freedom and the freedom of the world comes from the totalitarian states. There is no need to develop this idea. They are Satan's vicegerents of tyranny, the Antichrist's advance agents of adversity. But our point is that the gravest threat to freedom comes from within. I do not mean from America alone. I mean within the hearts and souls of men throughout the world. While the world is attempting to preserve freedom in the political order, it is surrendering it 
in those deeper realms upon which the political reposes. Picture a group of men on a rooftop proclaiming in song and story the glories of architecture. While below, saboteurs have already knocked out half the foundations of the house. And you already have the picture of modern freedom. Politicians in the upper stories are glorifying freedom. While philosophy in education and the so-called liberal Christianity has knocked away all the supports of freedom. First of all, freedom is denied in education today. This may sound rather bizarre to educators. We have been shouting catchwords about freedom for decades. But I submit that they are talking about license, not freedom. They are concerned with freedom from something, not freedom for something. They are interested only in freedom without law, not in freedom within the law. And the proof? Do not many educators today assume that evil and sin are due to ignorance? And that if we educate, we will remove evil? Do not others assume that evil is due to bad environment, bad teeth, or bad glands, and that an increase of material wealth will obliterate evil? Can they not see that these false assumptions destroy freedom? For if evil is the result of ignorance alone, and not the result of a perverse use of freedom, then Hitler is only an ignoramus. But he is not a villain. Can they not see that education without a proper philosophy of life can be made the servant of evil as well as of good? Have they not vision to see that if evil and sin are to be attributed to external circumstances, then man is not free to do wrong? Then wrong is in our environment, but not in our souls. Is it not inconsistent to praise men for choosing what is right, and at the same time, when he does wrong, deny that he is free? That kind of education, which denies guilt and sin, is destroying freedom in our democracy and is destroying it while our soldiers are fighting for it on 21 battlefronts of the world. And freedom, too, is being denied in modern religion. Oh, do not misunderstand me. I know it preaches freedom. But we are searching hearts, not lips. Modern religion denies freedom because it denies hell. In a recent survey of ministers, it was discovered that 73% did not believe in hell. If there is no hell, why should there be a heaven? If there is no wrong, and hence no sin for which a man ought to be punished, why should there be a heaven where he should be rewarded for his virtues? If there are statues erected to our patriots, why should there not be prisons for our traitors? Whom do they think God is? A kind of grandmother who laughs off the wrongdoing of children? as if there were no scales of justice, and he were not the God of righteousness, this sugary, pale, air sots of Christianity has set at naught the very doctrine which Christ himself has preached. For on more than a dozen occasions, our divine Lord said there was a hell. Hell is the eternal guarantee of human freedom. If God were to destroy hell, 
he would at that very moment destroy freedom. So long as there is a hell, we know that God respects human freedom. That he will not by force nor by power destroy even that free will which rises up against him with an everlasting, I will not serve. Satan is thus destroying our freedom. At the very moment, he has led us to believe that we are most free. And he has done so by the very same temptations which failed when he tempted Christ on the mountaintop at the beginning of his public life. You remember those temptations? Satan, first of all, tempted our Lord from his gospel of love by offering substitutes. In the first temptation, instead of winning souls through love, Satan suggested that Christ buy them with bread because men were hungry. And in the second temptation, instead of winning souls again through freedom and love, Satan suggested that Christ win them by some manifestation of power over nature, such as throwing himself from a temple tower unhurt. And in the third temptation, Satan suggested winning souls through politics. He unfurled before the mind's eye of the Savior all the nations and kingdoms and empires of the world. And in a frightening boast, as if to imply that all were his, Satan says, All these will I give thee. If falling down, thou wilt adore. Our Lord refused to surrender freedom. If souls would not love him without the bribery of bread, and without the exhibitionism of power, and without selling himself to Caesar, he would not force them Freedom would endure through an eternal heaven and an eternal hell. And Satan, who failed in that temptation, is back in the world again. And, oh, how he is succeeding now. Souls are selling themselves today for that bread which they call security. Selling faith for the power which is called science and progress. And while others, in over a fifth of the world's surface, have bartered freedom for dictators and tyrants. Dostoevsky that great Russian writer of the last century was right when in a great flash of genius he warned the world that the denial of sin and hell in education and religion would end in world socialism where men would surrender freedom for a false security. The Antichrist returning to the world and speaking to Christ he says, Dost thou not know that the ages will pass and humanity will proclaim by the lips of their sages that there is no crime, there is no sin, there is no guilt, there is only hunger, and men will come crawling and fawning to our feet and say, Give us bread, but take our freedom. I wonder if those days are not already here. And finally, in place of free men, 
The Antichrist pictures the new socialistic state that will be born, in which he and his followers will organize everything after they convince people that there is no sin, there is only hunger. And then they will crucify Christ, who will redeem them from God. And Antichrist speaks again and says to Christ, they will tremble impotently before our wrath, and their minds will grow fearful, and they will be quick to shed tears like women and children, but they will be just as ready at a sign from us to pass to laughter and rejoicing, to happy mirth and childish song. Yes, we, the Antichrist, shall set them to work. But in their leisure hours, we shall make their life like a child's game with children's songs and innocent dance. Oh, we shall allow them thin. They are weak and helpless. And they will love us like children because we allow them to sin. We shall tell them that every sin shall be expiated if it is done with our permission. That we will allow them to sin because we love them. And the punishment for these sins, we, we of the Antichrist, will take upon ourselves. And we shall take it upon ourselves and they will adore us as their savior. We who have taken on their sins before God, and they will have no secrets from us, we shall allow or forbid them to live with their wives and their mistresses, to have or not to have children, according to whether they have been obedient or disobedient. And they will submit to us gladly and cheerfully the most painful secrets of their conscience, all, all of them will bring to us. And we will have an answer for them all. And they will believe our answer. For it will save them from great anxiety and terrible agony that they endure at present in making free decisions for themselves. What I say to thee, O Christ, will come to pass. Our dominion will be built up. I repeat... Tomorrow thou shalt see that obedient flock, where a sign from me the Antichrist will hasten to heap up the hot cinders on a pile on which I shall burn thee for coming to hinder us. For if anyone has ever deserved our fires, it is thou, O Christ. Tomorrow I shall burn thee. Dixie! I have spoken. That is the way the Antichrist will speak in the new world. And this frightening spectacle is already taking place in a large part of the world today by denying responsibility to God Men have surrendered their freedom to Satan. And because such is the inevitable outcome of the world, unless we pray, we ask the Jews and the Protestants and the Catholics to spend an hour a day in prayer and meditation. We will help you in this by sending you free for the asking a little booklet of prayers for wartime entitled The Shield of Faith. But pray we must, lest we succumb to the temptation of the Antichrist. For the same challenge is being hurled at us which was hurled at Christ on the cross. Come down and we'll believe. The executioners, when they said that, were willing to admit that they would believe if he would only show his power by stepping down from his cross. The poor fools... Did they not see that they were asking him to force them to believe? 
which would have been the end of freedom. They were free to believe that he was the son of God so long as he did not come down to smite them. They had freedom so long as they left their faith in their own hands and not in his. His refusal to come down from that cross was the guarantee of freedom. The nails which pierced him were the stars on the flag of freedom. The bruises of his body battered by free men were the stripes of that flag. His blood was its red, his flesh its blue and its white. And so long as he hangs there and we have that vision in the world, man is free. The moment he comes down in power, man is a slave. And he is man's dictator. But he will not come down. Freedom will never be destroyed. Not even in hell. For even there, he leaves man the eternal choice of his free, rebellious will. And so, he did not come down. If he came down, he would have made Nazism and fascism and communism long before their time. The coming down is the death of love. If he came down, he never would have saved us. It is human to come down. It is divine to hang there. Unfurl and wave to the four winds of the world, O oh, battle flag of freedom. There will always be freedom when men are not forced to love. And there will always be love when men are not forced to be free. God love you. Our Lord Jesus Christ, who in thy mercy hearest the prayers of sinners, pour forth, we beseech thee, all grace and blessing upon our country and its citizens. We pray in particular for the President, for our Congress, for all our soldiers, for all who defend us in ships, whether on the seas or in the skies, for all who are suffering the hardships of war. We pray for all who are in peril or in danger. Bring us all after the troubles of this life under the haven of peace. And reunite us all together forever, O oh dear Lord, in thy glorious heavenly kingdom. The address you have just heard was entitled Freedom in Danger and was delivered by Monsignor Fulton J. Sheen of the Catholic University of America. This was the 14th in a series of addresses on the crisis in Christendom. A copy of today's talk, as well as the book referred to by Monsignor Sheen, The Shield of Faith, may be obtained by writing to the National Council of Catholic Men, Washington, D.C., or to the station to which you are now listening. We continue the Catholic Hour with the traditional hymn, Hail, Holy Queen.
Next Sunday at this time, Monsignor Sheen will deliver another address in the series entitled Acceptance of Divine Judgment. Your announcer is Bob Stanton. This program has been presented by the National Broadcasting Company and the independent radio stations associated with the NBC Network in cooperation with the National Council of Catholic Men and came to you from New York. This is the National Broadcasting Company. This is the Hour of St. Francis. You'll have to stop it. You'll 
have to pay back the company for all the material you took. Well, after all, Father, that's pretty hard. It's a lot to pay back, and besides, it's the way I said, I'm not the only one who's... You done. knew what you did was wrong. You knew it was a sin. Or you wouldn't have mentioned it in confession, would you? Uh, I know it wasn't right, but I don't think it's worth a lot of fuss. Oh, well, I, I suppose I'd have to cut it out and pay for the stuff. I spent the last 15 minutes trying to make you realize that the purpose of amendment and restitution mean just that. Your confession is no good without them. At least 20 more people waiting to go to confession. If you stop being stubborn and do what I tell you, you might as well leave. You mean you won't give me absolution? Well, I, I certainly don't see why not. I don't know how I can make it any clearer. You can't understand it by this time. You haven't the proper disposition to receive absolution. Well, I can't waste any more time with you. Come back when you're in a better frame of mind. You've flung yourself out of the church. You've whipped your hurt pride into a festering wound. He didn't have any right to refuse your absolution. All you did was ask a simple question. He wasn't even civil. You didn't go to confession to be insulted. You go looking for a little help and advice, and all you get is a calling down. Who does he think he is anyway? Just because he's a priest, he thinks he can go around insulting people? And that's the kind of people the church lets run a parish. They can tell other people what to do, and look at the way they act. You're not taking it from anybody. You have your pride. You'll go away all right, and you won't come back. Remember, remember the lost faith, the lost love, the strange hollowness of the first Sunday without Mass, the flinching of the mind away from Saturday four to six, seven to nine, learning to say, oh, I used to be a Catholic, marrying without the sacrament. Miriam didn't ask her to do that. She rather liked the Catholic Church. She was almost interested. But you said... No, I, I'm through with all that. And you gave her your ring in a dusty little office, and you pronounced your vows to a tired clerk with a swift, mechanical smile. You had your pride. And Miriam, seven years later... I wish there was something to hold me, but there isn't. It was hard I might not do it, to divorce so easy. I can't help it, Richard. I just don't want to settle down. You're dull and hard and all you think of is money. No. Not even a child is enough to hold me. Not even the child. Leonore. Leonore. The lovely. And the dead. You gave her all the love that was left in your heart. Everything was for Leonore. The money, the great house, the fine schools to fill her ever-hungry mind. Faster. Faster. Go faster, Richard Scott. For the bitterest and the blackest wave has lifted from the sea of memory to break upon your heart. Father, I want to go away for a year. I want to work somewhere just to see what it's like outside. I've been shut up with books so long. I'll come back, Father, when I've seen something of life. She came back, white and tired, and sat beside the fire and looked at you with the stranger's eyes. You've worked too hard, Leonora. You're tired out. I am tired. So many things. I've seen so much. It's worse than the book. What's the matter, Leonora? Nothing. Everything in life is hard and cruel and beastly. People suffer and I can't help them. I can't even help myself. What do you need? I'll get you anything you want. There's nothing you can do now. Too late. There is something I wanted to know. Father, were you really a Catholic once? Well... Yes, yes, a long time ago. What's it like? Is there really anything to it? I've been in the church. It looks interesting. Oh, there's nothing to it. Nothing? No, there, there, there may be 
some things. Some people have to have ceremony and mystery, and the, the church satisfies them. The whole thing is out of date. Is that why you left the church? Yes, of course. It, it isn't progressive. It's too dogmatic. Too many people telling you what to do. At least there'd be somebody to tell you. Uh, there's really nothing to it, Leonore. You'd waste your time thinking about it. You don't think I'd have given it up if it had been worthwhile, do you? No, of course not. I was just wondering. What's the matter, Leonore? What happened while you were away? Let me help you. You can't help what's already done. I can't minister to a diseased mind. I think I'll go to my room. All that you need is a good sleep. I'll have a good sleep. Goodbye, Father. Night, Leonore. There was nothing more. You said there was nothing more. I didn't mean it, Leonore. I didn't mean it. I'll make up for it. I'll help. I've already been helped. Why didn't you tell me, Father? The priest was very kind. Confession isn't hard. Why did you need him? I could have helped you. Can you... Forgive him. She had told him, and not you. He had helped her. You could not. Not then. Not then. Too late, too late. Father, is there really anything to it? No, no, nothing at all. But there is, Richard Scott. There is, there is. Walk, walk, take, take. years, the dead years, when you walked away from the church and led them after you, Miriam and Leonore. What did it matter? It was a little thing, a tiny thing, nothing at all. And for nothing you became the lost one, with the lost wife and the daughter, dead. And weren't there a hundred other priests, a thousand others for you to go to confession to? But you, you had your pride. You have it now, Richard Scott. Sleep with it. Eat with it. Love it now for all the long and empty years to come. You loved your pride once. More than God. More than yourself. Let it give back love for love. Let it save you from the depths. The depths of your iniquity. Like the depths of the sea. Where the river tide is running now. Dark and strong. And a man may fling his body down and let the river bear it off into the depths of the sea. Out of the depths have I cried unto thee. Cry now, Richard Scott. Cry now to God with the hunted mind running wildly down the dusty paths of prayer. Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. For with thee there is merciful forgiveness. Mercy for forgiveness. Is there only the river now? Only the river? There is one other thing. One other thing. The only thing. Bless me, Father. Yes, Shant. Go on. 
Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. How long has it been since you left confession? My last confession was 31 years ago. This quarter hour has been brought to you by the Third Order of St. Francis. It's much to mind your manners. Yes, boys and girls, it's time to mind your manners with Alan Ludden and his panel of typical teenagers. From the studios of WPIC in Hartford, Connecticut, the National Broadcasting Company presents a teenage discussion session for boys and girls from 8 to 18. Adults are invited to sit in on the meeting, too. So gather around, because here he comes, the man who conducts the meeting, that man who makes manners fun, Alan Ludden. Boys and girls, we're all set here in the studio with a fine audience full of eager boys and girls, a batch of real problems that you sent in, and our panel of typical teenagers. So, without any further ado, I'd like to have you meet your panel, and as usual, they will introduce themselves. This is Roy Peterson, 17 years old, high school senior. Pat Otley, 16 years old, high school senior. Emma O'Brien, 17 years old, high school senior. Sheila Gunning, 17 years old, high school senior. Dick Coop, 17 years old, high school senior. And as our authority from the younger set, we have our old friend... Ellen Lee, 12 years old, 7th grade. Well, panel, this past week, your friends all over the country sent you some very interesting problems, so let's go to work. The first letter that was chosen for your discussion came from Donnie Nevels, who lives in Scotlandville, Louisiana. And Donnie will receive $5 in saving stamps for sending us this problem. Last week at a dance, I had a most embarrassing thing happen to me. We were dancing and I was chewing gum. Suddenly I discovered that her hair and my gum were mixed up. I didn't know what to do. But I'd like to hear from those boys on your panel and know what they would have done in a case like this. All right, boys on the panel, what would you have done in a case like that, Emmett O'Brien? Well, I did it once. And tell us, I'll tell you that I was very embarrassed. Well, we just laughed it off, and I learned a lesson that I'd never chew gum while I'm dancing again. In other words, the best thing to be learned from this whole experience is not to chew gum while dancing. Yes. Well, what about it, though? How do you laugh off a thing like that? Roy Peterson, what word do you have for a boy who's caught in, say, such an embarrassing position? Well, I'd say about the only thing he can do is just apologize and not make a scene doing it. Just apologize easily without getting too excited about it, and then, should you ever chew gum again? No. No. It's... All right. What about it, Dick? What would you do in a case like this? Well, I... I just think that uh, the best thing to do would be just kind of uh, make a joke about it and try to uh, make it appear as though you're not taking it as though you don't want her to take it too seriously. Fine. I think a girl can help, don't you? Uh, yes. Dick, let's ask Sheila. Sheila, what could a girl do in a case like this? What if a boy got gum mixed up in your hair as you were dancing in a dance tonight? Oh, I don't think I'd mind too much. Just remember that it's a little item and it could happen any time. And not to be embarrassed and keep mentioning it over and over again. It, it, just forget it and laugh it off. What about the girl who makes a joke about it and talks about it, say, at an intermission? I think that, that's mean. That's mean. It embarrasses the boy further. All right, we hope the boy's worked it out in Scotlandville, Louisiana. He learns never to chew gum while dancing. Question number two comes to your panel from Sarah Diamond, who lives in Elmhurst, New York, and this is the problem she presents. A young man whom I have known for about a year is attending college in Georgia. He will be coming to New York for the Christmas holidays. As his parents are now in South America on a vacation, and they will not be back until after Christmas, I would like to know if it would be proper for me to invite him to stay at our house for the week between Christmas and New Year's. My parents approve. We have a large apartment, and there will be no difficulty whatsoever. Our only question is whether or not it would look all right for me to ask him. Sheila, what would you say? It was never proper for the girl herself to ask the fellow... Her, her parents might if she wanted to ask her mother to uh, ask the boy. But even then, I think the boy would probably enjoy staying at his own uh, boyfriend's house. He's a little freer there. I see. You recommend that if the boy, if a boyfriend can possibly have him for the holidays, that it would be perhaps happier for him. I think the girl should look around and see if he has any friends that would uh, invite him before she did himself herself and put him in the embarrassing position of saying no. Fine. Well, now, what about it, Pat? So should girls ever invite a boy in a case like this? Well, the girls themselves. No, it? I don't think it's proper for the girls themselves to do it. I think it would be much nicer if the mother did it. I think it's almost a must. Now, let's say, I think we can go on record as saying that the, by all means the mother or the or the, or the, or the some of the guardians or the hostess of the house should do it, not the girl. Yes, and uh, also I'd like to say to everybody that knows a college fellow or a girl coming home, please don't put too much of a... Oh, a drag on their time. They have such a little time to do such a lot. Oh, I know. College, uh, the college people have an awful problem on vacation. Yeah, don't they? but I don't, and also the college people remember that you do have an obligation to your parents to see them once in a while during your vacation. Well, I think that's only fair that we recommend that college, uh, returning college boys and girls uh, do pay, spend time with their parents. But let's talk about this. Do you think that college boys and girls, although 
None of us are college boys and girls right now. Certainly, I'm not. <laughs> um, do you think they do have a problem about this vacation, Roy Peterson? I think they do. The uh, people coming back from college, they have a few ideas and a few things they want to do during the vacation. And it seems when they get home, oftentimes the parents and friends have it all planned out for them. I think before uh, any plans are made, they should try to get together and uh, set some dates where the boy is going to do something he wants and he's going to do something that the parents and friends want. Fine, and nobody's feelings are going to get hurt. That's a good idea, don't you think? To avoid this business of having hurt feelings if the returning college man or girl doesn't have time to spend with you as you'd like. Well, I hope that everybody has it. all the... Co- Sheila, what's your last word? Well, I was going to say that's one reason why perhaps the boy would be better off staying at a fellow's house because he wouldn't be obligated to give his time to the girl and he'd be able to get out more. In the long run, then, you do feel that if it's possible at all for this boy in Elmhurst, New York, to stay with a boy, it would be better, but if he does stay with the girl, by all means, her mother should ask him. Now, panel, Christmas is almost here, and the major problem facing most of us these days will be the selection of the right Christmas gift for the people on our Christmas list. And since our job is to discuss problems that come up in the lives of boys and girls from 8 to 18, it's only right that we tackle the problem of Christmas gifts. Now, first of all, let's try to be practical. We'll try to take it up in age groups. Now, Ellen Lee, if you'll start off by telling us some of the gift ideas that you have gleaned from the letters we have received from boys and girls younger than teenage. We'll get this thing rolling. Now, Ellen Lee, what ideas do you have for, say, the families of boys and girls younger than teenage? Well, get something useful that you can probably use in the kitchen. Or get some small articles like some handkerchiefs or some wallets or some ties for your father. Well, now, let's throw up on that wallet, routine. How many wallets do you think your father likes? How many wallets can your father use, Ellen? Well, I think uh, two is about enough. Well, okay. I think that I'd be pretty safe in saying that one is about you, you lose things if you change. A man doesn't change wallets just as the girls change purses, you see. They don't have to match. They just have to have everything in there. <laughs> now, but you mentioned something about little things for the kitchen, little gadgets for the kitchen. Is that a good idea for boys and girls younger than teenagers? Yes, because they wouldn't be uh, too hard to buy and all your family would like them. And it would probably be something that your mother or father wouldn't think of getting. Fine. Ellen Lee, I want to, may I interrupt just a moment? I remember a letter from a young girl out in Illinois, and she wrote and said that the best idea for boys and girls younger than teenagers is to look around and see what their mother needs and what their mother has been missing for the last year, and then to supply that need by buying the little Christmas gifts. So that thought is a secret, isn't it? By all means, think about it. Now, what about for your friends, Ellen Lee? Do you have any words for them? Well, some games and some books are the best things to buy. And for some of your girlfriends, you could buy some ribbons. And handkerchiefs are also nice gifts. What kind of ribbons? Well, first you have to find out mostly what color clothes they wear, uh, so you'll be able to get the ribbons to match. Ribbons for the hair, though, that is? Yes. All right, well, now, you know, I think the teenagers have a little more money than the younger boys and girls. Not always, but the, <laughs> their gift problems are certainly more perplexing. So, panel, let's see what help we can give for the teenagers now in this problem of gift giving or Christmas gift giving. Uh, Pat Utley, let's start out with the girls. What about a girl giving her family presents? Well, uh, say your mother likes to sew or something like that, you could give her uh, something for her machine or some uh, material or patterns or something like that. If she likes cooking, a new cookbook she has in hand, that's a sort of a hint, though, that your mother doesn't cook that. <laughs> and uh, knitting, uh, you could give her some wool or something like that. And for Dad, though, I'd like to advise everybody to take a little time and think about it because it always seems to me that Dad never gets what he wants, really, or what he needs. Dad is the one who you can't ever think of anything for. That's right. right. If he has a hobby, of course, it's very easy. Otherwise, you could get him something to wear. Well, the boys will take up the problems of gifts for Dad, but now for Mother, you suggest things for the kitchen and for sewing? Yes. Well, last but, you know, don't you have any other little warmer gifts? Yes. Oh. I think Mother always likes to receive something personal on Christmas. I mean, it, it's really a time to give to the person, not to the home. A little luxury, a little mm. thing she wouldn't buy for herself. You don't think that's a good idea? Sheila, what do you have to say? Well, I just want to say if you just sit down about five minutes and, and think oh, what happens every day to a person, you can get a present that's going to be necessary to them and something that they wouldn't buy themselves. Just five minutes of thought put into it. All right, now we've got to get going, but now, boys, what about gifts for girls to give boyfriends? Let's hear from that, first of all. What, what word do you have for the girls who are going to buy presents today for their boyfriends, Dick Coop? Well, I think it depends mostly on the relationship of the girl and the boy. If uh, the girl and the boy are uh, going steady, I think a picture of uh, the girl is very a very good gift. Well, I, what's your idea? What's an idea you have? Well, let's suppose that the girl is uh, has been going with the boy because he's going to she's going to give him a present. Well, a good present I think would be uh, to look at his suit. She's seen it often enough. Say it's blue. Get him a nice maroon tie and a pair of maroon socks to match. In other words. Pick your tie and socks to uh, go with his clothing as far as uh, color goes. And then 
get the size right, too. That's awfully important. How do you do that, Emmett? How do you get the right size sock? Well, you can call up uh, the boy's mother and uh, ask what size shoe he takes. And the sock size is generally one or one and a half sizes bigger. And there was a boy from Mississippi that wrote us uh, not to give any pajamas or uh, slippers or robes or any real personal clothing. I think that's a good idea. I think girls should avoid giving too personal a gift to boys. Now, we have to wind this up, but... As we sum it all up, it seems to me that we advise by all means you give useful gifts that people know, you know people need. In the case of gentlemen, boys, be sure you get the right size just as in giving gifts to girls that you don't give too personal an item of clothing. And when you do, be sure that it fits. If it's uh, uh, something that they, they are to wear, that it must fit. We do recommend that you give thought to your Christmas gifts. And we'll talk more about it later. Now, as we talk, though, about Christmas gifts, we must surely get around to thinking about the wrappings on those gifts. It's perfectly true that an attractive wrapping can make a rather plain gift seem like something extra special. So we definitely recommend that you give some thought to your Christmas wrappings. And when you do, then you'll think about Christmas seals. Because there is no more appropriate decoration for American Christmas gifts and cards than the Christmas seals that are being sold right now by the National Tuberculosis Association. Those same Christmas seals carry with them an important message. You know, they say that you have helped the fight against the deadly menace of TB. This next year, tuberculosis will claim 50,000 victims. But it is possible to stop this disease, and the National Tuberculosis Association, with its 3,000 affiliated groups, is going to do it with your help. So remember, it's part of America's Christmas tradition to buy and to use Christmas seals. Now, before we get on to our prize questions, I want to announce our subject for the adult discussion period next week. So many parents and teenagers have asked us to consider the problem of young people and alcoholic beverages. We have decided to discuss it next week in this period. I'm mentioning it this week so that you, our audience, will have your chance to submit ideas for our discussion. And we will be able then to report more accurately your attitudes at our next meeting. Now we turn again to those problems sent in by boys and girls from 8 to 18. Question number three comes from Donald Pace in Washington, D.C. And for it, Donald receives $5 in savings stamps, and here is his question. I am 11 years of age and a stranger in this country. My teachers have been very kind to me and have done much to help me feel at home here. Mother would like for me to take to school Christmas gifts for my teachers. I am not sure if this is a custom here, and I do not wish to appear as though I am looking for favors. As I am too shy to ask my classmates advice, I thought the panel could advise me. Ellen, what advice do you have for Donald? Well, it's perfectly all right to get your teacher a gift, but make it impersonal and inexpensive. All right, then it is a custom in this country, right? Oh, yes. And now, do you think, panel, I want to ask one more question in this regard. Do you think, though, that American boys and girls uh, older than, say, 12 years old should make it a custom to give gifts to their teachers, Emmett O'Brien? No, I don't think so. And if you are going to give a gift, why not give it to a worthy cause? All right, what do you suggest, panel, about if you want to, if you feel like you must express some gratitude to your teacher, going together and giving one gift as a group? How do you feel about that, Roy? I think that's excellent. Everybody gets together and gets a good present. Sheila, how do you feel about it? Well, that's wonderful. Fine, well, then we do recommend that Donald, by all means, he takes his gift to his teacher. He takes his gift to his teachers and express his gratitude. Older though, think about it, do it in groups if possible. And now, so far today, we have awarded three prizes of $5 in savings stamps each, and there are three more prizes to come, including the grand prize of a $25 savings bond. Yes, sir? Each week, we give away six prizes, and here is Ed Anderson to tell you how you can win one of them. Boys and girls, if you have a problem in manners or social behavior, either at home, at school, or at parties, write it out and send it in to Mind Your Manners. Each week, we select five questions for discussion and award the writer of each $5 in savings stamps. For the best stated and most interesting question, we award a $25 savings bond. All entries become the property of this program. In case of ties, duplicate prizes will be awarded. The decision of the judges is final. Contest closes at midnight on Wednesday of each week. Entries received after that date are considered for the following week's contest. So send your problems in to Mind Your Manners at this address. Mind Your Manners, Department 4, National Broadcasting Company, Radio City, New York 20, New York. Send your entry today. And now it's time to hear from our studio audience. So how about it, audience? Are you ready for your right-wrong quiz? Yeah. Fine. Now, Eddie Robbins is going to read five statements about manners. Each statement is either right or wrong, and it's up to you to tell us which one it is. When you make up your mind, hold up your hand, and Ed Anderson will pick one of you to speak up for the audience. If you're selected, you'll get a fine gift. So get on your toes now and tell us whether these statements are right or wrong. An important rule of good table manners is to remember to swallow all of the food in your mouth before speaking and drinking. How about that? Is that right or wrong, young lady? Yes. That, yes. What do you mean? Yes, it's right or yes, it's wrong? Right. Right. It's right. You're so right. You should always swallow your food before drinking or speaking. What's your name? 
Me and two aspirin. Thank you, Nancy. Here's a little gift for you. Here's your second one, audience. When nothing else is handy, it is perfectly proper to push food onto your fork with your fingers. Now, is that right or wrong? No. 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 Is that right or wrong? It's wrong. It's wrong. What should you push your food onto your fork with? A knife or a fork. A knife okay. or a fork. Will you, what, is it a good idea to use a knife as a pusher? In American, well, in, American in, uh, eating custom, what? Spoon. Spoon? A spoon is a pusher? Do you recommend that, really? What about trying to manage without a pusher? And if you have to, what about a small piece of bread? Don't you think that'd be a good idea? I guess it would. Uh, I, I feel like I kind of led you into that, but you <laughs> don't recommend by all means using your fingers, do you? No, it isn't proper. It is not proper. What's your name? Jack Nassian. Thank you, Jack. Here's a gift for you, and here's your third one, audience. When cake or cookies are served from a large serving plate, you should always remember to put them on your plate before eating them. All right, now think about that. Is that right or wrong? Young man with a striped sweatshirt on. It's right. Right. You're so right. Why is it right? You don't remember it. I knew it. What is it? The story is this. When you get cake or cookies served to you at a party, you should take them and put them on your plate. Not, in other words, take them right off the plate they're served to you on and eat them. You should put them down on your plate and then eat them later. Uh, do you get the idea? Yes. Yeah. What's your name? Howard Linsky. Thank you, Howard. You got that right. And here's a gift for you. And thanks a lot. Now, here's the next one, audience. At parties, sandwiches and fruit should be cut up with a knife and eaten with a fork. All right, what about that now? Is that right or wrong? Is that right or wrong? Here is a young... She'll have to come over to our mic, Alan. She'll just step up here. Fine. It's... Wrong. That's wrong. You don't have to cut up sandwiches, do you? No. What about fruit? Do you have to cut up an apple before you eat it? I don't know. You don't know. Well, I don't think you do. I think you just eat an apple. That's the easiest way to do it. What's your name? Naomi Factor. Naomi, is that right? Yes. Thank you, Naomi. Here's a gift for you. Here's your fifth one, audience. Hostesses at a dinner party should always make a point of eating as slowly as the slowest guest. Now, think about that. Is that right or wrong? Is there a Girl Scout out there? You've got a Girl Scout right there. Let's talk to a Girl Scout. Oh, no, here's, that's a young little girl right there. What about that? Uh, I think it's, um, wrong. No, I don't. Let's try a Girl Scout right there, right behind There's you. one right over in the center, Alan. Well, there's one right on the side there, too. A little oh, girl yeah. Scout right there. I want to talk to you. We've got a lot of Girl Scouts today. Now, what yes. about hostesses? Should they eat as slow as the slowest eater? Yes. Yes, they should. They should never leave one eating alone, and we think that's right. So thank you a lot. What's your name? Dottie Lynn. Thank you, Dottie. That's a gift for you. And that does it for today, audience. But we've got another quiz scheduled for our next meeting, and you are all invited to come back and join in the fun next week. Now, let's go back to the panel and hear what they have to say in answer to the fourth question that was sent into them by June Howey in Rosamer, Quebec, Canada. What do you think about expensive Christmas gifts for boy or girlfriends? I have friends who are buying expensive gifts costing over five dollars for boys they have dated only a few times. I wonder if that is a good idea, and I would like to hear the panel's views on it. All right, panel, what are your views on expensive gifts, Emmett O'Brien? I don't think it's uh, right. Remember that it's the thought, not the expense of the gift. All right, Sheila, what word do you have on expensive gifts? I don't think a person would appreciate a gift if she knew that everybody else was getting the same thing. Well, what about it, boys? Do you like to receive expensive gifts from girls and you can't afford to give them one e an equally expensive, Roy? No, I certainly do not. In fact, I quite envy the girl that can spend $5 on every boy she's gone out with. Well, do you think that it's a good idea for a girl to do that? No, it makes the boy feel obligated as if he has to uh, outdo her in a way. Fine. We don't, I don't think it's a good idea. Do you, Dick? I don't want to express my opinion, but I feel kind of strongly about that one. What do you think? Well, no, I think that the uh, boy and the girl should give about equally expensive presents, but just something that uh, will be appreciated more than the cost. Fine. When the boy is put in a spot, don't, can we make that point clear that the boy is put in a spot when the girl gives him an expensive gift, Pat? Well, instead of giving every boy sent out with a Christmas gift, what? just send them a Christmas card. It's really the thought at Christmas time. All right, then we recommend cards. All right, audience, we recommend that the gift, the gift not be too expensive. I don't mean audience, I mean panel. You're still going to work now, and your question number five comes to you from Alice Jones in Fort Jarvis, New York. And, of course, Alice will receive $5 in saving stamps for submitting it, and here's her problem. When a girl asks a fellow from another school to her school dance, how should she manage the tickets? And what about other arrangements like transportation, flowers, and so forth? I would appreciate your help, as I am in a quandary. Sheila, can you help out Alice Jones in Fort Jarvis, New York? Well, if you're going to bring a fellow to your school dance, it's certainly up to you to get the tickets, because after all, you are inviting him. And you might leave the flowers up to him, though. And maybe suggest uh, what color your dress is or something, but leave it up to him to get the flowers. Well, and we've recommended before that the boys find out about the dress. It's not really up to the girl, is it, to suggest the color of her dress? Well, no, sometimes fellas ask you, say, what are you wearing, what color are you wearing, or something like that. That's a good idea, don't you think? And uh, as far as transportation goes, it's, I think it's really up to the fellow. But uh, if a girl knows that uh, 
some other girl is taking a fella to the dance who is acquainted with the, the fella she's bringing, she might tell him that uh, he's going and that he has a car or something like that. Uh, do you have anything to add to that, Cat? I certainly am. I think she listed just about everything. Fine. Well, I hope Alice Jones works it out. Her responsibility is to get the tickets and the rest of the responsibility is up to the boys, but she should help whenever possible. And now we come to the high point of the meeting, the grand prize question of the week. Now, here is the question that was judged the best stated and the most interesting of all those submitted this week, and for it, a young lady who lives in Parsons, Kansas, will receive a $25 savings bond. So, panel, your very best attention is invited now to the grand prize question of the week. Now that the Christmas season is so near, my friends and I are in the middle of a big argument with our parents. The problem is unchaperoned parties. We are juniors in high school, and most of us are 15. We date freshmen and sophomore college boys. We feel that we are old enough to be trusted at unchaperoned parties at our homes. But our mothers think that some older person should be at the parties with us. What does the panel think about this sort of thing? What do you think about this sort of thing, Dick Coot? Well, I think that um, they're going out with college boys without a chaperone is open to great criticism in the town. Uh, I should think that they would uh, not only want, but uh, necessitate a chaperone's presence at a party. What do you think about it, Pat Utley? Well, uh, first of all, before I say anything about the unchaperoned parties, I'd like to say something to the girls about going out with freshmen and sophomore college boys. You know, these fellas, I, I don't think a freshman or a sophomore college boy really holds an infatuation for a girl a long time. A lot of them do, a lot of them don't. <laughs> and when this, these college boys go off, uh, these girls are not going to know their own crowd as well. I think they're missing an awful lot by not going out with their own age group. Well, now that's fine. That's your philosophy on yep. going out with older boys. But what about uh, going to unchaperoned parties with them? Well, I don't think so. I think, you know, you can have a chaperone there, but not in the midst of the party. I know when I have a party, Mom always comes in to say hello to the people, and at, at the end she comes in to say goodbye, but the rest of the time she goes somewhere else in the house. Sheila? I don't think a girl could ever go to a party without a chaperone. She uh, is putting her reputation at stake. In other words, right. she should not only want but insist on a chaperone if she's going particularly with college boys and she is only a freshman or sophomore in college, high school, Definitely. or junior in high school. Incidentally, Ellen Lee, what about chaperones at parties? Do you think they spoil the fun at, even at your age? No, they can join in just the same and join in and have just the same fun as you can. After all, they are human beings themselves. <laughs> <laughs> chaperones are pretty nice people. In other words, don't be afraid of chaperones. Do you mind going to a party with a chaperone, Ellen Lee? Uh, no, I've never been to one. You've never been to a party with a chaperone? <laughs> nope. Well, now, you know that you've had parents at your parties, haven't you? Yes, That's but uh, the parents have been in the room with me, and they've helped mostly. Uh -huh. Well, those are chaperones, then. That's the same thing as a chaperone. Emmett, what word do you have on chaperones? Well, they're very important. I like to tell these girls to remember that they're still 15, and uh, they uh, have to have a chaperone, especially when they're going out with boys so much older. What about dances, incidentally? Let's talk to the boys and chaperones. When you go to a dance, a formal dance, and there is a whole line of chaperones. Say, now Christmas parties are coming up, you see. And you go into a dance, and there's a line of four or five chaperones. What should boys do, uh, Emmett? Well, they should try to dance with uh, quite a few of the chaperones. If not all, by all yeah. means one, and probably the, the senior chaperone, right? Yes, the senior what about girls? Should you dance with the men chaperones, Sheila? Well, if you're asked, I think you should dance with them definitely. Fine, and I think so. And I don't think you should be afraid of chaperones. We, of course, we can talk about what chaperones should do, too. We'll do that some other time. Right now, though, we open up the answer box to find the answers to those questions that were sent in, but they were not selected for discussion. Today's first question to come from the answer box is... The question that went unanswered last week from a young lady in Quebec, Canada. What's wrong with a 10-year-old girl wearing lipstick? Well, believe me, once again, our audience came through with some wonderful answers. Now, I enjoyed reading every one of them, and I was particularly pleased with the letters that came from girls who were 10, 11, and 12. Every single one of them said the same thing. They all pointed out that a 10-year-old girl has the beautiful natural coloring that only young girls can enjoy. And it's silly for girls so young to spoil their good lip looks by using makeup. And so, one and all, the letters recommended that young girls, 10, 11, 12... Wait as long as they can before they start wearing lipstick, and by all means, never wear lipstick until they are in their teens. From a boy in Cedar Falls, Iowa, should a girl wait in the car until her escort opens the car door for her? Yes, we think that young ladies should expect the boy to open the door for them when they are out on a formal date. From a boy in Los Angeles, California, when you double date for a dance, is it necessary for the two couples to get together after each set of dances? No, not necessary, but the girl should make it a point uh, the boy should make it a point of dancing at least once with the other fellow's date. From a girl in Erie, Pennsylvania, what time is it proper for a 15-year-old girl to be in on Friday and Saturday nights? Ha, ah, and that's the question we're going to leave up to you, our audience. We'd like to hear from parents and from youngsters on this. So will you sit down right now and send us your answer to this very serious problem? 
What time is it proper for a 15-year-old girl to be in on Friday and Saturday nights? We're going to be looking for your cards and letters right now, though the top just pops back on our answer box, and it's just about time to adjourn today's meeting. But before we do, let's hear from our panel one more time. This is Pat Utley with an invitation to the adults to send us their comments on our adult discussion period. This is Roy Peterson. If any of you fellows have problems, send them along to us here at Mind Your Manners. We like to consider some real men's problems in this meeting. This is Sheila Gunning, reminding you to put your full name and address on your cards and letters. This is Sick Coop. Remember, these meetings are for all boys and girls from 8 to 18. And that means you boys and girls who are younger than teenage are in on this show, too. Oh, yes, this is Alan Lee. And this is Emmett O'Brien with our address. Got a pencil? Okay, here's the address. Mind Your Manners, Department 4, National Broadcasting Company, Radio City, New York 20, New York. Well, pal, you did a fine job today, and I want to congratulate you again. Next week, we've got a big meeting scheduled with an adult discussion period devoted to the consideration of teenagers and alcoholic beverages. We're seriously anxious for your ideas on this problem, so won't you drop us a line? In the meantime, have a wonderful week, everybody, and don't be late next week. Until then, this is Alan Ludden saying goodbye now. Yes, boys and girls, this is your program. If you have a problem about social behavior, either at home, at school, or at parties, send it in to Mind Your Manners. You may win one of those six prizes. Remember, the best question wins a $25 savings bond. Mind Your Manners is produced by Robert DeFore. This is Ed Anderson reminding you that Alan Ludden will be calling another meeting to order next week at this same time, and you're invited. So we'll see you then. And in the meantime, remember... It is smart to mind your manners. <laughs> Mind Your Matters has come to you from the studios of WTIC in Hartford, Connecticut. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring unto thee pure oil olive, beaten for the lights, to cause the lamps to burn continually in the tabernacle of the congregation. And it shall be a statute forever in your generation. The eternal light. National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations make free time available to present The Eternal Light, a program which comes to you under the auspices of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. Our drama today is Morton Wishingrad Valley Forge and features Charles Irving. <laughs> Forge. Ice is on the school kill, and blood is on the snow of Pennsylvania. A fine dust of hail runs before the wind and covers the bloody footprint. But always the blood reappears. Confirmation in crimson that the army remains. In the valley lie the naked, starving rabble of the Continental Army of His Excellency, the Commander-in-Chief, General George Washington. There's meat in the wagon, Captain. Pull it out, Berger. Yes, sir. The meat belongs to me. Up with it, Henry. All right. A veal, Captain. Fine veal, sir. Put it down, you blackguard. The meat belongs to me. Does it, Palmer? I say the meat belongs to me. Good, then we can talk business. Where are you bound? That's my business. You go to Philadelphia, Palmer, don't you? I said 
That's my business. You'll sell the Lord how and leave us to starve. Burger, men, easy. I said easy. Farmer, we're not thieves, we're soldiers. Uh, the army pays ten pence a pound for veal. It's a good price. The British pay ten shillings. Why, you dirty profiteering dog. Pull back, brother. I'll help you. Pull back. Well? Yes, Captain. Back, sir. Back. Farmer, if you're an American, you'll not sell to the enemy and see your own soldiers go without. Uh, I don't know anything about that. Have ye silver? No. But we've good continental currency. Continental currency, do you say? Give me a wagon load of your continentals. I'll give you my veal pound for pound. Let's dump the wagon and take it. None of that, Burger. I say something. I say no. Do you hear me? No. We're soldiers, do you hear? All right, Farmer, you can go, but we can't forget. Uh, back to camp, man. Right. Burger, I said back. December 1777. Valley Forge. The ordeal of the American Revolution. What are we waiting around here for? All right, move along, Nick. Uh... I'm next, Dr. Waldo. What's wrong with you, lad? You look healthy enough. I have, um... I have the itch, doctor. Do you complain, lad? So have I. But, but, doctor... Get along, lad. Can you not afford hospitality to a few of God's homeless creatures? (laughs) Get along, lad. Leave me to attend my patient. Go next. The name is Berger, sir. All right, Berger. What's with E? Dysentery, Dr. Waldo. Hmm. A good democratic complaint, Mr. Berger? Go back and rest. Don't you have anything to give me, Doctor? I told you what to do. Rest. Yes, I see. Then, Doctor, something for a man in our tent. You saw Andrews last week, sir. The fever is still bad. Andrews. Ah, yes, I remember. Orderly, give him some mutton and grog for the sick man. Right away, Dr. Waldo. Is that all, Doctor? Mutton and grog? A capital medicine, Mr. Berger. Besides, it's all I have. Well, I thought, Doctor... Yes, well, it's no use. Look here, Berger. I'm no believer in pills or powders. I'll have none of the Boston physics that makes a man vomit up his money instead of his disease. Yes, sir. And be thankful for the mutton and grog. There'll be none of it tomorrow for your friend Andrews. Well, get along, I said. Get along. <laughs> now, what's so long, Henry? Where, where have you been, Berger? I'm... Freezing. Now lie down, Andrews. I'll start the fire. Now, here's the tinder, lad. Oh, that tinder is wet, Berger. Uh, give it here, lad. Uh, uh, the tinder is wet. But the powder's dry. There, uh, catch it quick. And uh, uh, that will do it. Uh, Henry, fetch some rails. But, Berger, it said Washington forbids burning the farmer's rails. Good, then we'll burn the farmer's house. But I shan't freeze. Fever and frost and farmer's... Uh, more than I can bear. They're not all bad, Andrews. Some of the farmers brought food today. No, oh, it's not them. The others, the pious, psalm singing patriots who carry their produce to the British. I, I hate them. Andrews, why don't you go to the surgery? No. If I'm to die, I'd sooner die here. Inside there. Inside the tent. Why is no sentry posted? Well, it, it's not my turn, Captain. Is it yours, Berger? No, sir. I bet it's yours, Andrews. And if it is? Mr. Andrews, I don't like your tone. Stand up when you address an officer. The man is ailing, Captain. Never mind that. Stand up, Andrews, and go to your post. I'll go. I'll go when you give me food. I have none to give. Boil the leather strap of your musket. I've already tasted that delicacy. Go to your post, Andrews. Do you mutiny, mister? I want bread. I said go to your post, soldier. No bread, Captain. No soldier. They have no mind, sir. He's with the typhus. I'll go for him. Bertie, you've just come back. Let me go and see. Uh, thanks, lad. That's all right. For an old hand like me, this cold isn't so bad. Now, give us your scarf, Henry. And another wrapping for the feet. All right. Captain, you won't report Andrews, sir, will you? He's not accountable now for what he says. Yes, I understand, Berger. You're a good man. I will report him. Go to the post. Henry. Henry, 
Where did you find him? No, not a sign. Andrews, there's no trace of him. I can't understand it. Burger should have been back two hours ago. Did you look for tracks in the snow, boy? Oh, I didn't think of that. I'm a fool. He'll be taken for a deserter if he's found. He'll be shot. Find him, Henry. Yes. Yes, I will. Bring him back. Bring him back. Burger. Jonathan Burger. Young Henry King in the bit of December of 1776, looking in the Pennsylvania snow for tracks. Jonathan Berger, do you hear me? Going further from the camp. Jonathan Berger! Moving out of bounds. Berger! While Andrew waited, burning with fever and fear. Berger! Berger! Oh, thank God. Did you follow me, lad? You'll be reported missing. They'll take you as a deserter. Me? Are you crazy, Henry? Then... Then why? Look here, on the road. Hmm? Deer tracks. All the way nearby, there's a deer run. Meat, Henry. Meat for Jack Andrews. Shh. Burger. Someone's coming. I have nothing to hide. Yeah, stay right with me. Burger. Oh, there. Oh, boy. Oh. Who goes on the road? It's us, Captain. Jonathan Berger and Henry King. Hello. Why are you out of bounds? We're seeking game, Captain. Was that so? Go back to your tent, both of you. You know better. It's to know better, sir, that a man in our tent is perishing for the lack of a bit of fresh meat. I'm truly sorry, Berger, but don't go any farther. Ain't no man to stop me, Captain. Not even General Washington himself. Mr. Berger, do you rebel? (laughs) Rebel? The word is that, Captain. Why not? The colonies are rebels. We're an army of rebels, aren't we? Please, Captain, he's lightheaded. He hasn't eaten Don't interrupt, lad. Captain, I ask you, what man set foot in America who wasn't a rebel? We're the most rebellious, dissentious nation on God's earth. Enough doctrine, Berger. Go back to your tent. Here's more doctrine, Captain. Eh? My musket. Good democratic doctrine, sir. What do you mean, Berger? There's a charge of gunpowder in my musket, Captain. That's what I mean. It makes me the equal of his lordship. Mister, do you threaten me? I don't threaten anyone, Captain. But you will observe that I carry my musket, and the lad here his, I observe. And, sir, you have only your sword. For the last time, go back to your tent. I am going back with meat, Captain. I see. I shall have to do my duty, Mr. Berger. I shall have to report you. Get up! report us for desertion. No, not he. For insubordination, perhaps, but not desertion. Now, let's go, Henry. The game won't wait for us. Nor will Andrew's fever. Good shot, Henry. That got him. Oh. What's the matter, boy? You're shaking all over. Am I? Buck fever. <laughs> you shot a man at Trenton without flinching, but you tremble before a deer. Ah, oh, curse the war that makes a lad like you. Who's oh, there? Put you. We're in for it, brother. They heard the shot. Go out of it. It looks like we caught a couple of deserters. Don't let them get away. Corporal, I give you these prisoners in charge. They're to wait outside until summoned by the court-martial. Yes, sir. Provost, I know these soldiers. They're good men. What's the charge against them? Desertion and being absent from post for this one. Desertion for the boy. Well, I suggest you let the men go into the house or you'll have dead prisoners on your hands. But, Captain, if I do... Be a good fellow, Provost. You don't want to cheat the court-martial, do you? Let them to the house before they freeze. And those are the charges against them, General Washington. I see. Gentlemen, what have you to say? You may have a lawyer, if you wish. Captain Ellison has sent word that he'd be happy to represent you. Did he, General? We won't forget that. But if you don't object, General, I'd like to speak for myself. And for the lad. I have no objections. Proceed. Thank you, General Washington. 
<laughs> All night long, I thought of what I would say. Now, it's hard to say it. General Washington, uh, gentlemen, I've served the Army since the beginning. Uh, the boy since he was 16. We know that, Mr. Berger. The muskets we carry, they're our own. The uniforms, our own rags, sir. We haven't been paid. We've been sick. We've been in hunger. And I think I don't complain of that. Oh, I've complained about good, good many things like the other men. But complaint for an American is no sin. <laughs> well spoken, Mr. Berger. Thank you, sir. The lad and me, we fight for the colonies. We know there are many in the colonies who side with the enemy and oppose us. I think perhaps we complain most of that. But whatever we think, sir, we've never thought of desertion because of that. No, no, because of anything. We were at Brandywine and Germantown. You think if we didn't desert then, we'd do it now? I admit to leaving my post. But you know why. And the lad went to find me. We aren't deserters, sir. That's the whole truth. Are you done, Mr. Berger? One thing more, if I may be allowed, sir. Yes? In the entire army, I should be the last to desert, sir. Why, Mr. Berger? Because my father came to the colonies from a place in Bavaria. A place where they burned down a synagogue. You are a Jew? Yes, sir. Each day I praise God that I am an American. And in America. What, what, Mr. Berger, is an American? I don't rightly know, sir. Our rabbi says it is what a man is and not what he has. Tell me, Mr. Berger, do you make texts like your rabbi when the enemy approaches? Uh, no, sir. I leave texts for Lord Howe. How so? To explain to his majesty why he wins every engagement yet cannot defeat us. <laughs> I like you, Mr. Berger. I think you're a good soldier. Everything you've told us convinces us that you're fine men, both of you. But an army rises or falls on discipline, and you have broken discipline. I'm sorry, Mr. Berger, but for the good of the army, we shall have to make an example of you. Regiments all present and accounted for, sir. Very good, Captain. What is your muster? Two hundred men, sir. Where are the others, Captain? Your orders are to march the whole regiment. The others are unfit for duty, General Washington. Oh. I should have known. Provost ready. He is, sir. This is a dirty business, Captain. I, I'm sick of it. All right, Captain. Whenever you're ready. Yes, sir. Drummer! <laughs> It is the order of the court martial that for the offenses committed, the prisoners are each to receive 20 strokes of the lash. I warn the men present against any demonstration or outcry. Provost, the lash! <laughs> Berger. Where's Berger? Easy, easy, hey. Henry. He's asleep. He's... All right. It was the cold more than the lash. The brutes, the filthy brutes. Andrews, go back to your blanket. You mustn't be up. You're, you're no, that's all right, Henry. I'm stronger than you think. I'm Jack Andrews. Well, I spit no grass grows. How can you joke? I'll joke or go mad. Which of you have? Water, Andrews. Some water. It's in my hand, boy. Here. Hold up your head. More. More, Andrews. No, no more. You'll get sick. Oh, why did he go off for that deer, that dumb, scuttle-faced fool? You know, the first time I've seen Washington so close, his nose is pitted with a pox, Andrews. But he laughed. You see, he was pleased by what Berger said. The greater the crime, then. 
I hate the army, Henry. I'm not going to stay another day. Henry, let's go. Let's get out. Let's quit. Andrews, you don't mean that. I'm sick. I'm sick, do you hear? I'm not going to die in this tent. Better in the snow where a man can fall asleep and think he's warm. Andrews. Berger. I thought you were asleep. No. Just too weak to talk. Throw a stick on the fire. To go to sleep. I'm glad you heard. My mind is fixed. If you and Henry won't go with me, there are others who will. Andrews, you can't quit now. They whipped you. It's no skin off your back. You let them beat you and you say that? Are you a man? Jonathan Berger, will you snivel and smile and give a kiss for a lashing? Oh, you're sick, Andrews. Yeah, but I'm not mad. You were lashed. I had a fair trial. Your back isn't so fair. It will heal. Go back to your blanket. Oh, no. No, I'm going out. You're going to stay here. Why? Tell me why. You belong here, that's why. Men like you don't run from a fight. A fight follows. Then you have to fight alone. What's the difference? You know what it is. No single man can make the fight. But all men together... You can't run from the fight and find what you look for. What you look for is right here. Whose fight? The merchants, the aristocrats? Yes, the merchants, the aristocrats. But your fight, too. One thing at a time, Andrews. Curse you, Jonathan Berger. May heaven curse you. Then you'll stay. May I have the black box? But you'll stay. I hope your teeth rot with scurvy. But you'll stay. Yes. I'll stay, I'll stay. Because you believe me? Quit it, will you? Don't plague me. I said I'll stay. What more do you want? Andrews. Andy. I want you to stay only if you want to stay. It must not be otherwise. Now quit, quit. I want to stay. You know it so. I... <laughs> I'm no deserter. <laughs> Captain, I, I want to talk. You need sleep, General Washington. Let Lord Howe sleep. I'm depressed. I'm tired and weary and depressed. Mrs. Washington thought to comfort me. She sent me her Bible, Captain. Look at the comfort. It opened in my fingers to the book of Job... My breath is corrupt, my days are extinct, the graves are ready for me. Are there not mockers with me, and doth not mine eye continue in their provocation? Close the book, sir. You have tribulations enough for one man. I doubt myself, Captain. Am I worthy of the fidelity of the men? I've always failed. That isn't true, sir. But it is true. It has always been true. At Fort Necessity 30 years ago, I failed. The Ohio campaign, failure. It hasn't changed. New York, Germantown, Brandywine, failures, all of them. The campaign against Canada miscarried, lost the whole thing. Sir, you are a rock that grows on adversity. Before God, I... I hope you're right. Captain, this is a great country. There are two million people in it. Something will come of them in spite of our failures. In spite of the Congress that sits and talks and sits and talks and promises. Captain, we need a miracle. Where is there a miracle? Where? Valley Forge was the miracle. Out of the ordeal and the blood on the snow and the rabble in the tent, something emerged. Spring came and the stricken, starved men stirred and quickened in the thin April sun. The men took ashes and sand and washed their rags in the river, and they were refreshed and clean. And that was a miracle. 
The shad in the thousands came boiling up the river to spawn. Another miracle. At falling spores, the half-crazy men stretched a net. They ate the first fish raw. Then they cooked it and ate more. Then they salted the rest. A fat little man named Punch Thorben began to drill them. Yes, he drilled them. They were awkward. They vexed him. He lost patience. But he drilled them. And they became an army. The army of human freedom that marches still. The army of... We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now we hear an address by Walter I. Sundland, prominent attorney, speaking from Providence, Rhode Island. Mr. Sundland. Men and women of America, on July 4th, we shall again celebrate our nation's birthday. Let us recall the preamble of our Constitution. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of our liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. It was first written at Valley Forge with the blood of invincible Americans of yesteryear who fought and died that this nation might live. From then on, our country never unsheathed its sword except in defense of freedom and liberty. Our nation just ended a war to strike down the madmen of Europe who tried to enslave mankind. Our legions, men and women of all faiths, Protestant, Catholic, and Jews, fought tenaciously for freedom and gave their all so that our banner of freedom should not fall. Mankind cannot forget the concentration camps and the crematories, the thousands of helpless little children and fine women and dignified mothers and fathers who endured tortured death because of intolerance and bigotry in its worst form. Almighty God did not give life a prophecy of hate, ignorance, and bigotry, sins that blot that have bloodstained the pages of history. Where did man get his godless intolerance? Let us proclaim as long as the heart shall beat, the dignity of man shall remain inviolate and complete. During the last war, men and women rose to a magnanimity of human life to save the lives of others who were of different faiths. Recall the Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish chaplains who gave up their life belt upon a destroyed and rapidly sinking ship who went to their deaths arm in arm so that others might live. Remember our sons and daughters of all faiths who fought and died to destroy barbarism and bigotry. Remember the chaplains, irrespective of their own faiths, who administered the dying G.I. when one of his own faith was not available. If in that intense struggle for life and country, men could rise to such nobility of character, then we surely should and can unite to drive out of our midst the sinister forces of intolerance. If a better world is to rise out of the rubble and ashes of the old, then such a spirit must rule our minds, move our hearts, and possess our souls as never before. Fellow Americans... With an invincible faith and an unbreakable spirit, the spirit of Valley Forge must live on and thus keep our nation a citadel of freedom and liberty for all. Thank you, Mr. Sundland. Today's Eternal Life program, Valley Forge, was written by Morton Wishengrass. The original music was composed by Morris Mamorski and conducted by Milton Caton. Featured as Jonathan Berger was Charles Irving. Arthur Cole played Andrews. James McCallion was Henry King. The part of the captain was performed by Grant Richards. Cantor David Putterman sang the liturgical introduction. The entire production was under the direction of Dan Sutter. Valley Forge was originally produced by the NBC University of the Air.
If you would like a free copy of the script, write to the Eternal Light, 3080 Broadway, New York 27, New York. This program is a weekly presentation of the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations in cooperation with the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. In Psalm 63, David said, My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips, when I remember thee upon my bed, and meditate on thee in the night watches. To help you focus your thoughts upon God at the close of this day, we bring you this devotional meditation from Morning and Evening by Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great English preacher of the 19th century. This evening's text is found in Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 19. I said not unto the seed of Jacob, Seek ye me in vain. We may gain much solace by considering what God has not said. What He has said is inexpressibly full of comfort and delight. What He has not said is scarcely less rich in consolation. It was one of these said nots which preserved the kingdom of Israel in the days of Jeroboam the son of Joash. For the Lord said not that He would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven. In our text we have an assurance that God will answer prayer. Because He hath not said unto the seed of Israel, Seek ye me in vain. You who write bitter things against yourselves should remember that. Let your doubts and fears say what they will. If God has not cut you off from mercy, there is no room for despair. Even the voice of conscience is of little weight if it be not seconded by the voice of God. What God has said, tremble at. But suffer not your vain imaginings to overwhelm you with despondency and sinful despair. Many timid persons have been vexed by the suspicion that there may be something in God's decree which shuts them out from hope. But here is a complete refutation to that troublesome fear, for no true seeker can be decreed to wrath. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I have not said, even in the secret of my unsearchable decree, Seek ye me in vain. God has clearly revealed that He will hear the prayer of those who call upon Him, and that declaration cannot be contravened. He has so firmly so truthfully, so righteously spoken, that there can be no room for doubt. He does not reveal his mind in unintelligible words, but he speaks plainly and positively, Ask, and ye shall receive. Believe, O trembler, this sure truth, that prayer must and shall be heard, and that never, even in the secrets of eternity, as the Lord said unto any living soul, Seek ye me in vain. This meditation was taken from Morning and Evening by C. H. Spurgeon. Please listen each evening at this same time for Morning and Evening.